congenital cardiac defects are abnormalities of the heart or the great vessels which are present at birth. These usually occur due to a defect during the embryogenesis process early in development that is during the 3 to 8 weeks. The etiologies mainly include environmental factors such as rubella, teratogens and maternal diabetes and also some genetic factors for example in trisomies 13, 15, 18 and 21 and also Turner's syndrome. Now we can classify these defects uh, on the basis of uh, a criteria that is if they cause a left to right shunt, if they cause a right to left shunt or if they cause obstruction of vessels. Uh, first of all, we are going to see the left to right shunts. Now, one thing to remember about them is that they are the most common congenital uh, heart disorders. They do not usually cause cyanosis, but their main complication is going to be Eisenmenger syndrome. This is actually a reversal of shunt when uh, the left to right shunt is then uh, over time converted into a right to left shunt. So, let's talk about this first. Now, don't get scared of this slide. It is very busy, I know, but uh, we're going to get through it. The first congenital heart defect to understand is patent foramen ovale. Now, to understand this, let's see some embryology. This here is the development of the septum between the two atria. So, this is the septum primum, which is uh, beginning to develop between the two atria. Then, as it reaches here, this becomes the septum primum and this becomes the septum secundum then we have another septum that grows like this so normally this is the foramen ovale so this is the right atrium and this is the left atrium so normally in the fetal life blood will flow like this and this will be no problem but after birth when the pressures on the left side of the heart rise they are going to push these flaps against each other and they will fuse and there will be no more uh, connection between the right atrium and the left atrium. But in this case, in the case of patent foramen ovale, the flap is of adequate size but it is not sealed. So we can see here that these flaps are of adequate size, they cover each other. It's not like there is a hole but the flaps do approximate but they have not joined. Okay. So I want you to distinguish between a patent foramen ovale and an atrial septal defect. Now in atrial septal defect what happens is that there is going to be a permanent hole here. Okay. So till 1, 2 and 3 the development is normal but here I have shown a atrial septal defect. So in this case you can clearly see that this hole is permanent. Okay. And uh, there is always going to be mixing, mixing of the blood between the right atrium and the left atrium but in this case you can see that even though these flaps have not been joined but still because right atrium has lower pressures what happens is and left atrium has higher pressures this will cause this to remain closed okay so we do not generally have many symptoms in this case this only occurs when the right atrial pressures in some cases rise due to increase venous return due to certain positions such as squatting etc so there will only be transient blood flow from right to left okay both of these are left to right shunts because here also the hole is uh, in the atria and because pressures here are increased blood should go like that but that usually does not happen what can happen is that when right atrial pressures increase there can be transient flow of blood from right to left so i hope uh, that is clear patent foramen ovale uh, do not have any complications uh, as such but this can manifest usually as a paradoxical emboli we know that usually there is a deep venous thrombosis in the legs and venous thrombosis whenever it uh, dislodges into emboli what will happen is that first of all they'll come to the right atrium right now technically they should go into the right ventricle and then into the pulmonary circulation so usually the dvts go into the pulmonary circulation but in this case what happens is that uh, since we have this uh, right to left shunt transiently not always but when right atrial pressures rise then there is a chance of paradoxical embolism that is uh, this emboli 
will go from uh, the veins into the right atrium and then to the left atrium and then through the uh, left ventricle to the systemic circulation so this embolism will not be going towards the pulmonary circulation but towards the systemic circulation which is not a usual case so that's why it is called paradoxical embolism i hope that is clear now in atrial septal defects as i said is that there is an abnormal fixed opening between the atrial septums okay now the ostium primum defects are 5% which are associated with down syndrome while majority of them are ostium secundum defects okay and in some cases there are also sinus venosus defects in 5% of the cases in this case we are going to have unrestricted blood flow between the two atria okay okay so regarding the clinical features these are usually asymptomatic till adulthood now we have a left to right shunt right so we know that left uh, heart has greater pressures so we are going to have blood uh, going from the left atrium to the right atrium and then into the right ventricle and this flow of blood is going to cause volume overload in the right atria and the right ventricle so we are going to have s2 splitting s2 is uh, as we know that it is due to pulmonary valve and aortic valve closure in this case what happens is that there is delayed pulmonary valve closure because the volume has increased because of this shunting so that's why we're going to have splitting of this heart sound these defects are usually well tolerated initially but can over time worsen because uh, because of all this shunting when we have this shunting towards the uh, right side of the heart and into the pulmonary circulation we can develop pulmonary hypertension so uh, and pulmonary hypertension is then going to cause right ventricular hypertrophy and eventual a reversal of shunt as well in some cases but that does not really happen uh, with atrial septal defects secondly we have ventricular septal defects these are most common congenital cardiac defects okay the size and location of the defect will vary widely now in case of large defects what happens is that of course it is a uh, left to right shunt so the blood will be pumped from the left side of the heart into the right side the right uh, right side of the heart will be congested and due to volume overload that will cause um, right ventricular hypertrophy dilation pulmonary artery diameter will be increased this will cause pulmonary hypertension vascular changes etc regarding the clinical features they may be asymptomatic they can these defects can close spontaneously as well and as i said before the reversal of shunt is more common in vsds than asds and also if these uh, defects are smaller and mostly they occur to on the top of the septum where the area is membranous and not that muscular what happens is that they are going to form jet lesions that is if a, if we have a small opening they are going to form jet like uh, blood flow and when this jet of blood is going to hit the right ventricle that is going to increase the risk for endocarditis because of damage to the endocardium the next disorder is patent ductus arteriosus it is associated with congenital rubella this is a point to remember now before birth what happens is that the right ventricle pumps blood into the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary trunk through the ductus arteriosus pumps this blood into the aorta because we do not uh, need to pump uh, uh, blood into the uh, lungs which have not inflated yet but after birth what happens is that due to increased oxygen tension and decreased pulmonary vascular uh, resistance and decreased prostaglandin e2 the ductus arteriosus closes on its own and we have the normal uh, adult blood flow but if we have a patent ductus arteriosus after birth that is the ductus arteriosus has not closed due to hypoxia then what happens is that we have another type of circulation that is this right atrium will pump blood into the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk and since aorta has higher pressures this will shunt blood from the aorta into the uh, pulmonary trunk and thus into the pulmonary arteries and into the lungs so this is also a left right shunt okay this is actually a high pressure left to right shunt it uh, it is going to produce machinery like murmurs okay now these pdas can be small or large small are mainly asymptomatic but larger pdas 
can lead to Eisenmenger syndrome that is eventual uh, reversal of the shunt and also increased risk for infective endocarditis. The treatment in this case is endomethacin which will decrease prostaglandin E2 and also surgical uh, intervention will be necessary for permanent cure if that does not work. So as a recap, during left to right shunts, we do not have cyanosis usually. The biggest threat is Eisenmenger syndrome which is most common in patent ductus arteriosus, common in ventricular septal defects and not that common in these two cases. Okay. So that is all about left to right shunts. Now let's see some right to left shunts. Now one thing to remember in this case is that the main symptom here will be early cyanosis and that will be shown by clubbing of fingertips and toe tips, polycythemia because RBC's number will be increased because the body will think that there is not enough RBC's, that's why there is cyanosis and paradoxical embolization. As I said before that uh, venous thrombi that develop mostly in the in the legs they will come to the right side of the heart of course and then they should have gone to the lungs and get stuck there but in right to left shunts uh, they might go from the right to left side of the heart and then into the systemic circulation and thus uh, get stuck somewhere else in the systemic circulation so that is called paradoxical embolization so these are the main symptoms of right to left shunts the first disorder is tetralogy of fallot now this is 5% of all congenital heart diseases and most common cyanotic congenital heart disease. So if you see cyanosis that is shortly after birth, the most common cause for that is uh, this disease. Now why does this occur to understand the cause of this? We need to know that there is an infundibular septum between the uh, developing, we need to know that there is an infundibular septum between the developing pulmonary trunk and the aorta. So in this case what happens is that there is anterior superior displacement of that septum. So when that occurs this is going to change into this. You can see here that the aorta has become bigger and the pulmonary artery has become stenosed. right? And also uh, the aorta has overridden the septum. There is also a ventricular septal defect formation and since we have pulmonary artery stenosis thus we are going to have right ventricular hypertrophy. So that are the four features of this disease. Pulmonary stenosis, overriding aorta, ventricular septal defect and right ventricular hypertrophy. Now with that aside, let's see what uh, clinical features we are going to uh, see. The hemodynamic disturbances in this case occur because of the right to left shunt. Now you might say that this is a simple VSD right and in VSDs we have seen that we have a, usually a left to right shunt but in this case we have a right to left shunt because here you can see that the pulmonary artery is stenosed and um, right ventricle has undergone hypertrophy so the pressures now on the right side are higher than those on the left side so we have a right to left shunt. There is also decreased uh, pulmonary blood flow which will cause symptoms and increased aortic volumes that will cause the um, hemodynamic disturbances. So these three are the causes of the hemodynamic disturbances that we are going to see. The clinical features in this case are going to depend on the degree of pulmonary trunk stenosis. That simply means that if the stenosis is not that severe and blood can be pumped into the lungs, then the right side of the heart will not have that much pressure and the right to left shunt will not be there in the first place and it will resemble isolated VSD because the right ventricle has not undergone hypertrophy, it is not having increased pressures so there is no uh, right to left shunt. If we consider a normal ventricular septal defect then we have greater pressures on the left side and then that will be a left to right shunt if there is a uh, mild degree of pulmonary stenosis. One other thing to remember is that although in this case we have right ventricular hypertrophy and we've seen that whenever that happens uh, just as in left to right shunts uh, there is severe uh, complications of pulmonary hypertension but, th but in this case what will happen is that this pulmonary orifice stenosis is going to protect the lung from that volume overload and thus no pulmonary hypertension develops in this case although the right ventricular hypertrophy is there.
Now, regarding some sequelae or complications of uh, this disorder, we have cyanotic signs, as I've mentioned before. There is also increased risk for infective endocarditis, and this is usually common in diseases when we uh, see septal defects in which there is high pressure on one side and lower pressure on the other side, and blood gushes through small orifices and hits the walls of the heart. So, uh, that is potentially a cause of infective endocarditis because there is um, damage to the heart uh, walls and then uh, any bacteria or foreign agent can come along and cause inflammation there so that is one problem and secondly we can have systemic embolization of course this is a right to left shunt so uh, the embolus can pass from the right side of the heart to the left side and thus into the systemic circulation now one thing to remember about this anatomical setting is that if the pulmonary trunk is severely stenosed that is it is completely obstructed and there is no way that the right ventricle can pump blood into the pulmonary trunk what will happen is that there is only this ventricular septal defect that will uh, cause right ventricle to pump blood into the left ventricle and thus into the aorta and this PDA if there is a persistent ductus arteriosus now this will be protective in this case because that is the only way that this blood, this deoxygenated blood, which cannot be pumped into the lungs via here, can go to the lungs by using this path. So a PDA will be the only supply uh, to the lungs, only way to supply blood to the lungs if the right ventricular outflow is completely obstructed. Okay, And one diagnostic sign for this disease is boot-shaped heart on x-ray. The second right to left shunt is transposition of great artery. That means both the great arteries, the aorta and the pulmonary arteries have changed their positions. That is the pulmonary artery arises from the left ventricle and the aorta arises from the right ventricle. So if that happens, then you can see that let's see the aorta is arising from the right ventricle, right? So it will go to the body tissues, then come back through the venous uh, circulation and go to the right atrium. So this is an independent circuit and similarly the left ventricle pumping blood into the pulmonary artery and then uh, going back through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium that will be an independent circuit as well. So both the pulmonary and systemic circuits will not mix. This condition is not compatible with life unless there is a VSD or a patent foramen ovale or PDA present because these are the defects if we have a defect here or here or between the uh, pulmonary artery and the aorta so these will be the only ways that blood can be mixed and can sustain life now one thing we know that this condition is not compatible with life but if we have a VSD that can sustain life and it can deliver oxygenated blood to the aorta so if we have a VSD what will happen right ventricular hypertrophy will be there because this in this case is functioning as the systemic ventricle. You can see here that the right ventricle is connected to the systemic circulation. So the right ventricle will, will act as the systemic ventricle and it will undergo hypertrophy and the left ventricle has no such load on it. So it is going to undergo hypoplasty. Now the clinical features of course they will be there when the patient is alive and uh, there is a ventricular septal defect. So uh, this will depend on the magnitude of the shunting and there can be different clinical features. This They also depend on the degree of tissue hypoxia and the ability of the right ventricle to maintain the systemic pressures. Now most patients uh, with transposition of great arteries die during the first few months if they do not undergo uh, surgery. And lastly, the third type of congenital heart defects are obstructive lesions. We can have pulmonary valve stenosis, aortic valve stenosis or complete atresia and coarctation of aorta. Now there is two types of coarctation of aorta. First is the infantile form which is preductal, and the other is adult form which is postductal. We call it a ductal but there is no PDA in this case. Okay, Infantile form or the preductal form is often associated with the patent ductus arteriosus. But in this case the coarctation, the constriction of the aorta will lie distal to the aortic arch to this but uh, before the PDA. Okay, so this is something you need to remember. Now if you see this diagram, we can see that this is the aortic arch, the brachiocephalic trunk, the right one, 
there is one and um, the left common carotid and the left subclavian have already arised from the arch of the aorta and then we have the constriction so the uh, the head head and the upper limb region will not be affected by this um, by this disease but the lower extremities will suffer the most and um, it is usually associated with lower extremity cyanosis in infants at birth it is usually associated with turner syndrome okay the second form is the adult form of the coarctation of aorta. It is also known as postductal, although it is not associated with a PDA. This is uh, just to show uh, a difference between the infantile and the uh, adult form. This is the ligamentum arteriosum. Okay, this is not the uh, ductus arteriosus. This is usually associated with a bicuspid aortic valve. This is also a genetic abnormality. Now, what happens is that in this case, the coarctation is also distal to the aortic arch. Now, there is a mechanism called collateral circulation in which what happens is that the post stenotic descending aorta, this part is going to receive blood from branches of the subclavian artery and axillary arteries via the intercostal arteries. So, intercostal arteries are, go, uh, are going to, so intercostal arteries are going to go and feed these, uh, this part of the descending aorta. Now we know that the intercostal arteries are present along the ribs and this has a characteristic sign on x-ray that is called rib notching. So this is a characteristic diagnostic sign of uh, the adult form of coarctation of aorta. Similarly, it is going to cause hypertension in the upper extremities and hypotension in the lower extremities. That's all about coarctation of aorta. Now let's see tricuspid atresia. Now in this case we have complete blockage of the tricuspid valve and the right ventricle is hypoplastic. Now this is usually associated with an atrial septal defect because of course for this fetus uh, to be born there has to be a right to left channel uh, through which the normal fetal circulation goes but, um, but we do not uh, need the right ventricle uh, during the fetal life right but as soon as this baby is born and we need the lungs to function that will not occur and there is no passage from the right ventricle to the lungs so this will present as early cyanosis and lastly we have the truncus arteriosus that fails to divide into the um, into the aorta and the pulmonary trunk and there is a single large artery that arises from the right ventricle and the left ventricle okay so this will also uh, present as early cyanosis because the deoxygenated blood from here and the oxygenated blood from here are going to mix as soon as they get out of the respective ventricles. So that is the last of the congenital disorders and that's it.